The Clyde Beatty Show. The world's greatest wild animal trainer, Clyde Beatty, with another exciting adventure from his brilliant career. The circus means fun for both young and old. Thrills, excitement, snarling jungle beasts. But under the big top, where Clyde Beatty constantly risks death in the most dangerous act on earth, you see only part of the story. Much of the real drama takes place behind the scenes of the circus, where 500 people live as one family, or in faraway places of the world, where this master of the big cats has journeyed, hunting down his beasts in their native jungle. All of this is part of the Clyde Beatty story. This is the story of the bear. Juro had quite a reputation for agility, for cleverness, and for unexpected turns of spirited meanness. Juro was a 600-pound, 7-foot-tall brown bear, and he sounded like a possibility for the trained bear act I was planning to get together when I returned to the United States from a British Isles tour. So when I learned that Juro was being exhibited as part of a small traveling circus, I watched my chance, and one morning in the tiny mountain village of Clonbake in North Wales, my wife Harriet and I caught the show. Oh, Clyde. Clyde, look. Yes, honey? Isn't it different, though? Here in the open, and the roundabout crank by hand instead of the merry-go-round. And costermongers instead of pitchmen. And jellied eels instead of cotton candy. Uh, <laughs> sure, but the circus is the circus the world over. Oh, yes, Clyde. Yes, it is. There was no tent. Only a semicircle of plank seats on the grassy Klonvik and cricket ground. But there were wide-eyed kids, part of a circus audience wherever you find it watching the jugglers, the fire-eater, the tumblers. And then a strange, pale, yellow-haired young man slipped down onto the plank seat beside us. You be Mr. Clyde Beatty, sir, and you be Mrs. Beatty, mistress? Yes, yes, that's right. And you come here, I think, to see Juro, the great and wonderful brand bear? That's a pretty reasonable guess. Be like and well, mistress. Oh, I'm afraid my husband and I don't understand well. My meaning was, thank you very much, mistress. Uh, you seem to know us. Maybe you've seen our wild animal show, huh? That may be as may be. I'm set to see things by my own means in my own way. Dreamy Tom it is, they call me, though Tom Cobb, my right name is. Oh, but here's what you've come for. Juro the bear. And all in under the great chain to the ring in his nose, that's his fine and famous trainer, John Moffat. Clyde. Clyde, look at his face. Look at the trainer's face. Yeah, he's been in a scrap, all right. Oh, his face all clawed and, and torn. Now John Moffat will tell his lie. What's that, Cobb? His lie? Yes, listen. Hi, Welsh friends. He's not you a Welshman. Sure he's English. Presented as a feature attraction of Warford performing bears, this is Juro. 600 pounds, measuring four, seven feet in height. The savage bear that escaped last night, as you all know. Escaped, Clyde. Did you hear that? I hear it. Juro's escape endangered the entire countryside until I located and recaptured him early this morning. John Morford lies. Juro, Juro is still at large. Well, how can Juro be at large? That's Juro right there in the circus ring. If you please, no, it is not. It is a different bear. A different bear, Carl. Substituted. John Morford could not find Juro. That Madras bear is still roaming the countryside. We return to our story, The Bear, in a moment. Here is Clyde Beatty. Tom Cobb sat down beside Harriet and me at the open-air Welsh circus to tell us that the bear, Juro, was still at large. Juro had escaped the night before, that was certain. And Cobb insisted that the trainer, Morford, had been unable to find him. And so had substituted another bear in order not to lose the day's circus business. Then Cobb told us we could find him at a pub called The Sun in Splendor and left as unexpectedly as he'd come. Well, by this time, Harriet and I had grown pretty curious. So after the performance ended, we made our way up a crooked Welsh street toward The Sun in Splendor. Oh, there's The Sun in Splendor, Clyde. Where? There, see the sign? Oh, yes, end of the block. Clyde, do you think Tom Cobb was really telling us the truth? Well, I noticed a couple of things that seemed to support what he said. That bear we saw perform just now was no great shakes. No, I and noticed that. We'd heard that Juro was quite a performer. Yes, yes, that's right. And something else. Did you notice, honey? Mm. Through the whole performance, the trainer, Morford, never once called the bear by name. 
Maybe that's the way he works, but it's certainly unusual. Yes. Yes, it is, of course. But, Clyde... What, honey? To substitute another animal, to pretend to have caught Juro if he hadn't... Well, he might have done that in order not to lose the day's profits, as Tom Cobb said, but... Clyde, it would be criminal to let people think they were safe when anybody going up in the hills might be attacked and even killed by Juro. Sure would. Well, here we are, dear. There's the sun and splendor. <clears throat> Come on, let's go in. Oh, there's Tom Cobb. Over there at that table in the corner. Uh, there, uh, there, past the dartboard. What will it be for drink, Mr. and Mrs.? Well, we've come in to see Tom Cobb, bartender. Oh, that's it. Then you'll be once in tea. Oh, why tea? For dreamy Tom to read what your character and future is out of the tea leaves. Oh, is that what he does? Dreamy Tom Cobb, indeed, it is all what he does, tea leaves and fortune telling. <laughs> We crossed to the dimly lit corner table where Tom Cobb sat watching us approach, a half-mocking smile on his face, his fingertips drumming on the table surface. We sat down, but Tom Cobb waited till the bartender had brought the tea before he spoke. And then, his head cocked impertinently on the side, he said, I'm glad to see you us come, Mr. and Mrs. Beatty. Thank you. Uh, you said, Cobb, we'd find you here if we wanted to know more about the escaped bear. Yes, Mr. Beatty. I suppose you spoke to us in the first place because we work with wild animals. Yes, Mr. Beatty. Well, then, if the bear is still loose... Yes, it... Mr. Beatty, it is. Well, what do you want us to do? Recapture it, is that it? Yes, Mr. Beatty. Well, you'll have to give us more details, Cobb. If the bear's loose, it's a danger to the community. But so far, we've just got your word that it is. And that's not very much to go on. Well, I will tell you just how it was from the beginning. Now, that's a very good idea. It was last evening Juro escaped. We know that. His daughter, John Morford's daughter, Kate, was with Juro and he broke loose. He went for Morford like he hated him. The bear did and had reason. Reason? Yes. John Morford knows his trainer like you, Mr. Beatty. He is cruel. He beats his bears. All right. Then what happened last night? Juro attacked John Morford. John Morford drove him off. And then Juro escaped. Yes, sir. Does anyone know where the bear went? Well, it was coming on dark. And town people see him go up a mountain here about. Vaswin Mountain, Mrs. Beatty. Vaswin Mountain? Yes. And then, Cobb? John Morford could not find him. So he substituted a ringer, a different bear that he said was Juro. Yes, Mr. Beatty. Clyde. Hmm. Here comes Mr. Morford. Is he coming to talk to you, Cobb? That may be as may be. No, look you. The game of dots it is that interests him so he can be near us and eavesdrop. <laughs> John Morford played alone at the dartboard a few feet away, throwing the darts, recovering them, walking back and forth in earshot of our table. But when we had finished our tea, Tom Cobb found a way of talking to us in spite of Morford. There is things has been seen in the bottom of teacups by dreamy Tom Cobb as would amaze you, Mr. and Mrs. If I may take your cup, please, Mrs. Betty. So. Oh, of course, if you want to. Now I hold it in my left hand, the cup, and rotate it round three times so. Now. Upside down into the saucer, letting the dregs drain and the leaves fall in their prophetic places. Look you now, Mrs. and Mr., the shapes and the tea leaves, just here, the glowering, horned face of the devil himself. What does the devil's head in the tea leaves mean, Mr. Cobb? An evil person is nearby. I see. You mean John Morford? Yes, mistress. And here is a chimney shaped to the cup. The meaning of the chimney is, do what you are about to do with caution. And here... This shape, which has the meaning, your delay may cause trouble, do not delay, and the shape which has that meaning in the prophecy of the tea leaves is a bear. Cobb, we're... My wife and I are pretty practical people, you know. Is there anything uh, that would make us believe what, what the tea leaves say? The meaning of the letters of the alphabet in the cup is that they be the initials of someone really important to the whole tea leaf reading. And in this teacup? Look you, the initials... K.M. K.M. The M would be for Morford. Yes. And the K, isn't that for Kate? Kate Morford? Yes, he said Morford's daughter's name was Kate. But that is so, Mr. and Mrs. Morford's daughter's name, it is Kate. And here are her initials in the teacup, so plain as never could be missed. I see. Well, then, uh, how much is the tea leaf reading, Cobb? It'd be five shillings, sir. I paid the five-shilling fee for the benefit of John Morford, who was watching. Then Harriet and I left the sun in splendor. It was clear enough that Cobb hadn't been prophesying from the tea leaves, but giving information. 
and it was just as clear that Cobb's information led to Kate Morford. Harriet and I went back to the circus grounds and questioned the wiry dark man who cranked the roundabout. Kate Morford? Do I know her? Lord lummy, do I know her. And she many's the day helping me crank this balmy roundabout for to give rides to the kiddies. Can you tell me where we can find her here on the circus grounds? Well, now, that's queer. Indeed, it is queer. Kate's not been around the old loving day. We're looking for Kate Morford, hotel keeper. She knows it's here. But she and her father are staying here at your hotel. Yes. Well, can you tell us when Kate Morford went out? Quarter to four it was, to hunt the bear. She has no come back here. Quarter to four this morning. Let me carry the broom at least, darling. The brush is getting thicker and it's awkward for you. But that chair to manage, too. Okay. Here you go. Oh, yes. Darn chair legs keep snagging in the brush. Well, the chair will come in handy if we do find Joro. Uh, can you handle the broom through here all right? Oh, yes. Doggone right the chair will come in handy. Nothing better for warding off an angry bear than kitchen chair legs. And this broom will stick in his mouth. Yeah, that straw will give Juro something to chew on, if we find him. Hey, hmm? hold it, honey. What? What is it, Crud? Look here, here on the ground. Those are... Sure, sure they are. Bear tracks, but look. Yes, where? Here, and here. Oh, yes. A man's see. tracks with him, going up the mountain. A man leading a chain bear up the mountain. See the relative positions of the tracks, a chain length between them. That man must have been Morford. Leading one of his bears up here to bring it back down again. As if it were Juro, just recaptured. That's my guess. Then Tom Cobb's story is the truth, Clyde. And Juro's still loose somewhere up here. And Clyde... Clyde, what about Kate Morford? I don't know, Harriet. The woman in charge at her hotel said she left to look for the bear and didn't come back. Left at four this morning. That was 11 hours ago. And now, here is an important message. Back to our thrilling Clyde Beatty drama. <laughs> Harriet and I followed the dual tracks of the bear trainer John Morford and the chained bear a quarter of a mile further up Baswin Mountain. Then, sure enough, the tracks turned and started back down again by the trail leading into the village. It was proof that the bear being exhibited was not Juro, that Juro was still at large. And then suddenly, a hundred yards further up the mountain. Clyde, Clyde, what do you suppose that is? Where, Harriet? There, all grown over at the front. But it's an opening. Look, into the mountain. Yeah, looks like the opening of an abandoned coal mine. Clyde. Yeah, Harriet? Clyde, I thought... Did you hear anything? I thought I heard something with the wind so loud. Clyde. Clyde, it is Joro. Yes, and he's in the abandoned mine. Here's the flashlight. Shine the light ahead of me as we go down the mine shaft. Oh, yes, Clyde. Clyde! What was that? Oh, just shale, honey. Loose shale along the walls of the shaft. You notice the breeze? Oh, yes. I do. It's fresh. No carbonic acid gas. No choke damp. This air is pure. But it seems to be blowing out toward us from down in the mine. That's right. There must be another shaft. Hey, stop a minute. What, Clyde? Shine your flashlight off to the right. To the right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, another cutting, another shaft going off to the right. Clyde, this could be a whole maze, the whole mountainside honeycomb. Well, that's pretty likely. The mine was probably worked out before it was abandoned. Clyde, which branch shall we take? Shall we go straight on or to the shaft to the right? we better get Juro to help us decide. I'll call him. Joro! Joro! What's happened? Why doesn't he growl? I don't know. An animal usually responds when it hears its name. All right, shine your flash into the branch to the right. All right. Clyde, there's a shape, a figure. A figure moving toward us. And it's not Joro. It's a human being. Come on, let's go. Wait a minute. 
Look here on the mine shaft floor. What is it? A scar. A woman's scar. All right now, Cobb. You'd better tell us what you're doing in here in the mine. I was passing. I had vices in the mine, so I come in. You expect me to believe that? It's just the truth, sir. Where did you get in? The opening, just behind. This shaft opens to the outside? Oh, yes. Well, then let's get out in the daylight. Now, Cobb? Yes, sir? What happened after Mrs. Beatty and I left the sun in splendor? John Morford come over to me. Well? He knew what my purpose was in talking to you, and he said he knew you was Clyde Beatty. I suppose he read that in the tea leaves. Oh, now, mistress, I do not think he did. What did he say about the bear? Oh, he was cute about that. He said his fear was you would report him to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, which is a vast power here in Britain. You mean for beating his bears? Yes. Cobb, what about your part in this? It seems to me you're going to a dickens of a lot of trouble over something that doesn't concern you very much. It does concern me. It does? Kate Morford. Oh. So that's it. It is. Then you're interested in her. Terrible much. But her father, he don't like that. Harriet, hand me the scarf we found in the mine. Oh, yes. Here you are, Clyde. Thank you. Have you ever seen this scarf before, Cobb? It is Kate's. Kate's. How come you buy it? It was on the floor of the mine. Oh, Cuthrall, Ufan. We went back into the mine. Tom Cobb behind, myself in the lead, kitchen chair in my left hand, broom in my right, against the possible attack of Juro. Harriet was between us with a flashlight. The flashlight threw my shadow black, huge, along one jagged wall of the shaft. Here's where we found the scarf. Well, we'll try this shaft branch now. Scarf, Kate Morford's scarf, was right here at the division. Now, she could have gone either way. Or been dragged on. Yes, I'm afraid that's possible, too. Keep the light well ahead, honey. Oh, yes, Clyde. Cobb, you say Morford mistreats his bears pretty badly, huh? Both of it in the public houses. And I've seen it me own self, him whipping the bears and then bought in like spring calves. What about Kate, Kate? Does she work in the show? She does, sir. And is she your father's daughter? I mean, does she mistreat the bears, too? I do not know about that. Are you sure you don't, Cobb? Did you get Harriet and me into this because you were concerned about the townspeople? Or was it because you were afraid Kate Morford was up here with an animal she'd abused? I am a feared for us, sir. That is the truth. And the rest of it. Is Kate Morford cruel to the bears, like her father? I do not know about that. All right, Cobb. Oh, look, Clyde. We're coming out to the surface again. That's daylight from around the turn in the shaft ahead. Yeah. And I'll be glad to get out of this mine. You were right a while ago, Harriet, when you said the whole mountainside was honeycombed. These shafts lead out of the mine in all directions. Don't you suppose we ought to go back down in the mine again and try to find... No. No, we won't need to. We won't? Look here. Juro's tracks. Harriet, a girl's tracks with them. Sets of tracks were plain in the silt around the shaft mouth of the abandoned mine. Juros and a girl. And that girl would be Kate Morford. The tracks both took the same direction, into a box canyon closed in by rock walls. We followed them until they vanished into the heavy growth of interlocked alders and pines. So the bear and the girl were in this box canyon. But it was strange, except for the birds and insects and the wind in the tops of the trees, there wasn't a sound. And then suddenly we heard... <laughs> That was Juro. It sure was. Come on, let's go. We scrambled and fought our way through the scrub. There was no problem of direction. The canyon was small and the roars and bellows of the bear guided us. Spring from us by the alders, we could see a man's arm lifting and falling. It was clear he was wielding a whip. Take this and lift, fellow teacher. I threw down broom and kitchen chair and broke through the brush. Juro was on a rope tied to an alder. The animal was bellowing and roaring, but in rage and sympathy, not in pain. John Morford was wielding an animal whip, but it was not Juro he was striking. He was beating his own daughter. Now, look what you've done. 
you've done, Kate. Brought the great biggie. All right, Morford, drop that whip. Drop it before I knock it out of your hands. Knock it out of my hands, will you? I sure will. Oh, look, 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 look. He's going to hit you with a whip. Oh, no, he's not. Kate, back you. Give me that whip. Give me uh, that whip. Uh, keep your hands off my whip, you. Uh, uh. Mm. There. Now, I'll keep this, Morford. Oh. Are you all right? Are you all right, Kate? Oh, what a terrible thing, Carl. This poor girl. Well, Kate. you're a credit to the animal training profession, Morford. Beating animals is bad enough, but a man who beats his own daughter... I suppose, great, Mr. Beatty, you'll report me to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. You're right, Morford, I will. I'll break up your bear act if it's the last thing I do. But there's a worse charge against you than bear beating. You'll be lucky if you don't serve a prison term for what you've just done to your daughter. Will it be tea again, though Tom Cobb is not here? Three cups, bartender, for Miss Morford and for my wife and myself. Yes, sir. Tom Cobb said he'd come here to the Sun and Spender and meet us. Oh. I mustn't see him. Well, why not, Kate? I just, I just mustn't. I cried. I think Kate means he mustn't see her. She's been crying. She doesn't look her best. Tom said, you see, I must leave my father and come to him. But it's odd to leave one's father. Of course it is. Tell us, Kate, why was your father angry with you? It was because I sided with Jura. Against your father? Yes. Father thinks of his animals as enemies. It's the bears against himself and... I believe that to be the right thing until I met Tom Cobb. Here's the tea. Thank you, bartender. Drink your tea, Kate, and you'll feel better. Yes, but then I must go. I don't want to see Tom. Not now. Before you go, Kate, I'd like to know what happened last night and today. Judo escaped last evening. He attacked Father and Father beat him off. Then he got away. Yes, we know that. Judo went up back in mountain and Father couldn't find him. So your father substituted another bear in Judo's place. Yes. But I went this morning to look for Jura, and I found him. But I didn't bring him back. Why didn't you? I couldn't, because of the whipping father would give him when I brought him back. You see, Tom Cobb has opened my eyes, Mr. and Mrs. Spitey. Yes. Yes, we do, sir. Kate Morford finished her tea and left the sun in splendor. In a few minutes, Tom Cobb came in and joined us. What? What are your plans, Mr. and Mrs. Beatty? Oh, we'll be leaving your country, Tom, after we've given our testimony against Morford to the Humane Society headquarters in Cardiff. And you will not buy the bear, and your visit has been a waste. Well, we won't buy Juro for our circus. We don't use whip-broken animals. But I'd hardly say our time's been wasted. It has not been for us, yeah. Only there's little we can do in return. Perhaps a final tea leaf reading, Tom. Very well, mistress, if you would like. The tea leaves form an arch in this cup just here. And the meaning is there's a power of love binding the owner of this cup to another, and their love will be blessed, and it will prosper. And that is my prophecy and final wish for you, Mr. and Mrs. Beatty. But, Tom... Yes, mistress? Kate Morford was here and had tea with us, and the cup in which you've just read the tea leaves was Kate's cup. In a moment, Clyde Beatty will be back to tell us about our next story. But now... Once more, here is Clyde Beatty. One of the more pleasant duties of a circus owner is traveling to far-off places in search of performers for the show. A few years ago, Harriet and I were in the Malay Peninsula, preparing to return to America with a boatload of wild animals. Before leaving, we found we not only had our jungle performers aboard, but a fabulous troupe of Malay dancers as well. I'll tell you about it when next we meet in a dramatic tale entitled The Princess and the Tigress. All stories are based upon incidents in the career of the world-famous Clyde Beatty and the Clyde Beatty Circus. The Clyde Beatty Show is produced by Shirley Thomas. The Bear was written by William Fifield. All names used were fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a Commodore production. <laughs>